Howdy! Thanks for learning about MS with me, Aaron Boster. If YouTube has served you up this video, it's likely that you or someone that you love is impacted by multiple sclerosis. I'm an MS neurologist in sunny Columbus, Ohio. I've been caring for families impacted by MS for about 20 years, and I created this YouTube channel to help up your game. In this video, I wanted to discuss ocrelizumab, ocrevus one of the most commonly used medicines to treat multiple sclerosis, and in my biased opinion, one of the most effective. I've been giving Ocrevus for quite some time, and over the years, I've developed some tricks and tips for how to make it the most successful I can. In this video, I'm gonna share with you eight weird ways of getting Ocrevus. And I warn you, most of them are off-label, but they work really well in my clinical practice. So if you're curious about different ways of giving Ocrevus, don't turn away because all of that starts right now. Hey! We'll start by discussing the standard method. This is how I infuse 95% of the patients that we treat at the Boster Center for MS. And it's pretty much per the American label. Ocrelizumab is an infused drug, it's given in the vein, and it's administered every six months, which I interpret to mean every 24 weeks. The first dose we break in half for safety reasons. So we give you half the dose, which is 300 milligrams, and we infuse that over two and a half hours, and then two weeks later, we give you the other half. After that, we give you a full 600 milligrams every 24 weeks, and we infuse that over two and a half hours. Now, before we give you the Ocrevus, we give you some pre-medications to prepare your body to receive the med and to tolerate it very well. This includes 125 milligrams of solumedrol, that's a steroid. We give Benadryl and we give Tylenol, and that works very, very well. This is the standard way that we do it, and then after the infusion, we kind of watch the person for just about an hour to make sure they're feeling okay before we let them go. Again, this is how I infuse the vast majority of patients at the Boster Center for MS. But I'm now gonna share eight other permutations of different tricks and tips for various situations. So let's jump in. The second method that I'll talk about is called the slow method. Now, when we developed ocrelizumab, it was intended to be infused over five hours. So each infusion was five hours, which is way too long. I'm very proud that I participated in a clinical trial where we proved that it's safe to give it over two and a half hours, which is my standard practice. However, very rarely patients don't tolerate it when you give it that fast. And I do mean rarely. In my entire practice, there may be one or two patients total where we use the slow method. What's the slow method? We just give it over five hours the way that we used to. So it's the same as before where you do a half dose, two weeks later, a half dose and then you do a full dose every 24 weeks, you give the same pre-medication, you monitor the same afterwards. The only difference is they sit in the chair and get the infusion over five hours. Again, this is not something that I find to be necessary almost ever, but rarely when a patient doesn't tolerate the infusion, we can slow it down. The third infusion technique I'll talk about is changing up the pre-medication. Now, the vast majority of patients massively benefit from being pre-medicated with a steroid, with Benadryl, and with Tylenol. Every once in a while, however, somebody has a paradoxical reaction to Benadryl. They don't tolerate it very well. Or they have a very unpleasant reaction to steroids, or they can't tolerate steroids. In these circumstances, there have been times where we will remove either the steroid or the Benadryl from the pre-medication. Now, this is off-label, and I recommend caution when doing this, because the reason we give the pre-meds is to make the infusion more tolerable. My nurses are experts at giving this, and in those situations, they watch those patients very carefully. I'll share with you that in those unique situations, we've had great success while removing a Benadryl or removing a steroid. Next, I want to tackle how we manage crap gap. So, what is crap gap? There are some people with MS on Ocrevus who notice a so-called wearing off period just before their next infusion. So about a month prior to their upcoming infusion, they sort of don't feel very well and they have a reemergence of fatigue and they have a reemergence of several neurological symptoms. It's as if they have four or five awesome months and then they have a month leading up to their next infusion where they're not doing so hot. I want to stress that the vast majority of my patients do not experience crap gap, but there are certainly some that do. And at the Boster Center, we've come up with several off-label ways of handling this that seem to work pretty well. 
I'll preface this by saying there's no scientific experiment done. This is just anecdotal best practices in my clinic. So what do we do? The most common thing that's done to deal with crap gap is to simply give a gram of IV steroids, of IV solumetra on the vein, about one month prior to the upcoming infusion. This seems to work super well, and we've had great success in doing this with most of our patients. There's a slight spin on this where instead of giving high-dose IV solumedrol, we may use high-dose oral pills. Both are really accomplishing the same goal. We're quelling inflammation and helping them cruise into their infusion, removing the crap gap. The next two methods for dealing with crap gap are off-label and largely theoretical. They're hard to pull off, but they would work. The first involves giving someone a shot of ufotumumab, that's Kesempta, a month prior to their ochreous infusion. Kesempta is a anti-CD20, it's a B-cell depleter, very similar to ochreous, but it's in a self-administered shot, and there are samples that are available. So theoretically, if someone got a hold of one of those shots, they could self-inject one month before their ochreous, raise uh, the level of the B-cell depleter in their body, and coast them through their infusion process without crap gap. Again, this is theoretical. The third way of addressing crap gap would be my favorite if it was available, but unfortunately because of the American label and because of insurance companies, it's not really available, at least here in the United States. And that would be to give the ochreous every four months. Now I'm gonna date myself, but way back in the ancient days of yesteryear, before ochreous was available, we would use a medicine called rituximab, which is similar to ochreous. And back then, sometimes we were able to administer rituximab every four months. And in my clinical experience, that worked much better. So if I was king for a day and I had a patient who was responding to ochreous but having crap gap, I would love to give it to them three times a year. Unfortunately, that's a theoretical option only. Real quick before we go on, if you found some value in this video, do me a solid and give it a thumbs up. Also, if you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please consider doing so. Those two actions teach the YouTube algorithm that you like this content and help push it out so more families impacted by MS can benefit. Thank you. The next three techniques are all geared towards mitigating the risk of infection. Ocrelizumab is a highly effective drug which works by suppressing adult B cells. Now, whereas this is very effective to manage MS, it can increase the risk of infection, which is no laughing matter. And so there are situations, particularly in folks that are probably over the age of 65 and also may have other comorbid risk factors for infection, where we want to mitigate that risk. And so the next three techniques help us do that. The first of these techniques involves adding an infusion called IVIG. Now allow me to explain. When you give someone ochreous, it's a best practice to check their IgG levels. IgG is doctor talk for their antibody levels. And if you find that their antibody levels have become suppressed because of the ochreous, they might be at increased risk of infection. If you give them a second infusion, a medicine called IVIG, you're giving them a bunch of pooled antibodies and you push the antibody levels back up. You can give IVIG along with ochreous and you can mitigate that risk. And in some patients, we've done this very successfully. The second technique to mitigate risk is to give ochreous less frequently. We will sometimes, in some patients, administer ochreous only once a year. We have found that in some patients, they don't remake their B cells very quickly. And we don't have to give it to them every six months. And in a handful of patients, we've been successful in dosing them only once a year. A third technique for mitigating risk is to dose ochreous eloquently. What I mean by that is, instead of just giving it every six months, or instead of giving it only once a year, we choose when we redose based on some special numbers. We can draw blood and we can look at what we call the CD19 count, which is a way of measuring B cells in the bloodstream. And if we've given you ochreous, Afterwards, the CD19 count is zero, and it will stay zero for quite some time. So what we'll do, instead of just giving you your next dose at six months, is we check a CD19 count at six months, and if it's zero, we don't dose yet. We wait until it goes above zero. As soon as it goes above zero, we give you your next dose. This is a way of mitigating the risk-benefit, 
and only giving you the drug when your body appears ready to receive it. The last technique I want to describe has to deal with planning pregnancy. Many people impacted by MS are women of childbearing potential and they want to be treated for their MS and they want to start a family or they want to grow their family. And so there are a couple ways of doing that. And there's a fantastic French paper that I recently reviewed and I love their suggestions and I use it in my clinical practice to help families conceive on Ocrevus. And it's pretty easy to do. It works like this. You're taking Ocrevus, you're taking Ocrevus, and then you get your last dose Four months later, you attempt conception. So you remove the contraception, you have copious intercourse with the goal of becoming pregnant. And we do not redose the ocrevus. We keep you off the drug. You aggressively attempt conception and you continue to do so until you're successfully become pregnant. At that time, we don't redo redose ocrevus. You gestate, you grow the baby, you deliver the baby, and then you breastfeed for upwards of a couple months and after you're done breastfeeding, we give the next dose of Ocrevus. Ostensibly, the person will be off B cell depletion for quite some time. What we have found in this French study, and what seemed to work in my practice, is it's kept the disease very, very quiet. This is really a fantastic risk benefit, in my opinion, to allow a family to conceive without having to switch up their medicines and without putting the baby at risk. My name is Aaron Boster, and thank you for learning about MS with me. In this video, I've shared with you several different ways of giving ocrelizumab. Most of them are off-label, and I'm not promoting them. And of course, you need to talk to your neurologist about what is right and safe for you. I also want to reiterate that 95% of my patients are treated with the first method I described. I just thought I would share with you some of the things I've picked up along the way, treating people with MS and giving them Ocrevus. If you'd like to up your game, click the next video that's on your screen right now. And until my next Monday morning video or my next live stream, or even better yet, the next time I see you at the Boster Center for MS, this is Aaron Boster saying be safe and take care.